day, YouTube. My name is Colin, and today's video is all about the bright future of Bitcoin. All right, so we've busted out the whiteboard, and I have here five reasons why I'm super excited about the future of Bitcoin. Now, so much is talked about Bitcoin in terms of as an investment, as a way to make money. Is it is it a good buy? Is it a, when should I get in? When should I get out? Is it in a bubble? Um, this is not so much going to be based on that. This is going to be the other the other part that I feel like is oftentimes overlooked, which is really what is going on with this whole cryptocurrency movement. You know, what does it mean for countries, for dollars, for currencies? That is overlooked, and today we're going to look at that. Now, first off, we're starting off with a big one, and that is that it is an international currency, right? So. It's not like a dollar in one part of the region or a euro in Europe or a rupee uh, over in India. It is one currency that's, you don't have to worry about exchange rates or the strength of a certain currency or the debt of a certain country to another country to affect the currency or trade rates, anything like that. It's one solid currency, which makes so much sense considering we're in a global world. These We're in a global economy and we do business globally, we do trade globally, we buy things from around the world. It, it just only makes so much sense that we should have one unified currency, and that is what Bitcoin is. All right, moving down the line to number two, it is a finite resource, right? So at the end of the day, after all the coins have been mined, there will, there will be no more coins, so many other currencies. We'll take the US dollar. Now the US dollar, just they just keep printing more of it and more of it and more of it. And as you know, that leads to what we call inflation, where every dollar becomes worth less and less and less. Everybody knows about inflation, but also all too often, we just ignore it and we don't think about it and we don't process it with our investments so and we don't, we don't account for it. So with a finite resource, you eliminate that inflation, okay? Next we have central banks. <clears throat> this, this, <laughs> This is a big topic and I'm gonna to try to brush on a topic that really should be just covered in like an hour long video. And I'm gonna to try to quickly summarize this point. But every country has a central bank, all right? I know I have subscribers and a lot of viewers around the world in places like India, Canada, not just the US. So, so all over the world, countries have their own central banks. All right, if you're in India, you have the Reserve Bank of India that was formed in 1935. If you're in the U.S., you have the Federal Reserve, which was formed uh, in uh, 1913, I believe. So it just it's over 100 years ago. And prior to these, prior to a central bank, you had individual banks that would loan out money. Okay, so say you had 10 pounds of gold, you could choose to just have it in your house, you know, and hide it under your bed. Might be kind of risky. Instead, you could bring it to a bank and have it put in a safe and get a bank note. All right, now. It became more and more popular. People were, were putting in their valuables and getting bank notes. Pretty soon, instead of if I wanted to go buy a car, instead of actually exchanging gold, I would just exchange the bank note because then that person could go cash that bank note in and get the gold. Now, people started, it was just much easier to just trade pieces of paper than actual pieces of gold, and it, and it required less steps and it streamlined the whole process of purchasing. So you had a currency of bank notes, right? Pretty soon, banks started getting a little greedy and and sort of realizing, well, nobody's actually coming back and trading in. Compared to all the notes they're writing out, very few of them actually ever come back and claim those notes. Instead, they just use them as currency. So what they began doing, which by all accounts should be considered fraudulent, they were issuing more notes than, what, than the actual assets that they had in their safe. And so then you fast forward, eventually it caught up and you had people coming, crashing the banks, and the banks could not pay out all the notes because they got too greedy and they issued out too many notes because they kept testing the boundaries. It's, it's something that's considered a fractional reserve banking, which still happens today, where you pay out more, you only actually have a fraction of the assets that, you've, that you're loaning out. Entirely, extremely risky, and it caught up to the banks. So there was a big, there's a big push politically to try to fix this issue because obviously as a, as a consumer, as a citizen, you were concerned that you couldn't trust a bank, you couldn't trust a bank to, to actually keep track of your money. So what did Congress do? Here in the US, there was actually, 
and this, I don't want to get off on too far of a tangent, but the creation of the Federal Reserve is, is just, a, it's, a, it's a pretty crazy story. Uh, you know, I might actually link to a documentary on YouTube that's actually really, really interesting if you really want to watch it. I don't know if I'm allowed to do that. It's not one of my videos, no affiliation, but I just, I think you guys would benefit from it if you watched it. So I might put that in the comment section. Anyways, the gist of it is we had senators like Senator Aldrich meeting with a handful of powerful, prominent bankers down at this place called Jekinaw Island, right off of the coast of, I believe, Georgia. And they actually met at a JP Morgan owned resort to try to have a discussion. This was all under the rug, all completely, you know, even when they, there's stories about even when they were traveling for this meeting, they were using false names at different hotels and different train tickets and that kind of thing to, to form this meeting because it was top secret. Of course, it all got gets exposed later, but they had this secret meeting, and where these prominent bankers are meeting with Congress and formulating how they're going to create a system that allows the public to be satisfied with the stability of their money being in banks without actually cutting the bank's profit out of the picture and allowing them to still do a lot of these crazy things that they make so much money off of that are extremely risky. Okay, and that's how they form a centralized bank. Similar to nowadays where it's happening in healthcare where the insurance companies, where the public is really looking for a for universal type healthcare and the insurance companies are very much trying to ensure their pockets still get lined. So they're having all these meetings with politicians. Whole side topic, we'll leave that out of the video, but back in this day or in the early 1900s, it was the banking industry that was doing this, okay? And so, what they created was one centralized bank. So maybe down in, say, Alabama, you have a bank that's issuing out a bunch of money, way more money than it has. And say, say it issues out 10 times as much money as it has in its safe. Well, let's say that 20% of the people come back in to claim that money. Well, that bank's not going to have enough money to pay out. So they created a centralized bank to get the money loaned to them. And the central bank works with all the banks across the country because obviously, Maybe 20% of the people in Alabama will claim will want to come back in and get their money, but maybe there's a bank out there in Dallas, Texas, where no, where very few people are coming back to claim their money, so they can just spread that money around. Instead of honing in on the banking industry and fixing it by forcing them to be more responsible, you, you they went another route and they created centralized banks, which also creates stability and still allows them to line their pockets. Tying this all back into the video, if you have Bitcoin, you get rid of the Federal Reserve, you get rid of the Reserve Bank of India, and you stop allowing all of the crooked, corrupt things that these institutions can do to just create money and cause inflation. All right. So the Federal Reserve here in the US, it was created in 1913, and they've been able to print money whenever they want to and loan it out to the US government. Okay. Since 1913, your do a dollar in 1913 is worth four cents today. That's how crazy inflation just shot up with the Federal Reserve. There's a lot of crooked underhand things going, going on that are benefiting the banks, that are hurting us. Again, I really want, I would urge anybody to watch this video to either get a book on the Federal Reserve or watch a documentary or start researching what's going on with the Federal Reserve because, or the cent or central banks all over the country, in Canada, India, everywhere because it'll really open your eyes to what's going on in the financial industry and how the laws are written in such a way that it gives such an advantage to banks and such a disadvantage to the government and to its citizens. So you eliminate that with Bitcoin or a centralized or a central finite currency that cannot be manipulated in the same ways that say a US dollar or a rupee or a euro or anything else can be manipulated. All right. Now, the next topic here, the next point I want to bring up is that we're in a digital age, all right? So getting to something that's a digital currency like Bitcoin just seems like the next natural progression. Most of the most of the transactions nowadays anyways don't use physical US dollars or physical euros or anything else, right? You go to the grocery store, half the time you're gonna write, you're not gonna pull out actual cash, half the time you just swipe a Visa card or a check card or maybe you even write a check. It's all just digital transactions. So. Why do we even have paper money? It's a matter of time before we get rid of paper money and go to digital currency anyways. And Bitcoin is helping us move in that progression just a little bit quicker. Now the last one, number five, 
the last and final thing I'll talk about, and I talked about this a little bit when I got into my little tangent about central banks and about the corruption of the Federal Reserve and other institutions, um, and that is government control. All right, governments are being concerned. Governments are gravely concerned about what's going on with Bitcoin because they cannot manipulate and control it the way they can their own currency. And I love that. All right, that's what currency should be. Okay, and these institutions that have so much control over something and can just deflate and create something like it's like a Federal Reserve or a central bank and deflate our money so that we're robbed of our own assets all while they benefit just kills us. Okay, and it kills us as citizens, as businesses, as investors. All right, and I would love to see something like Bitcoin totally disrupt that whole process. All right, so there you have it. Five reasons why I really hope to see Bitcoin succeed. As you'll notice, I didn't talk about whether I was gonna buy Bitcoin or whether I think it's a good investment. If you really wanna know my opinion on that, I think Bitcoin has run up exponentially at a unsustainable rate. And it's, if, it's gonna have to take a drop if it wants to be sustainable because no currency can be that volatile and expect anybody to hold on to it. Can you imagine if the US dollar changed tenfold in value one year it's it's crazy that's why i'm i'm confident about the future i'm not so confident about the present of bitcoin and i don't know if i want to dive in and i personally i'm not going to be buying a bitcoin at this time because it's extremely volatile and there's so many things that need to be ironed out however i do think down the line some type of cryptocurrency or some type of international currency like bitcoin maybe bitcoin maybe something like bitcoin is definitely the future and I really hope it succeeds because it would fix so many things that are wrong with money and wrong with currency and wrong as far as central banks, as far as stabilities of currencies and things like that that are robbing us as consumers and investors. So hope you enjoyed the video. Hope it was enlightening. If you found it fun, if you found it educational, feel free to give a like. Also, feel free to comment. If you haven't subscribed, you may want to. I talk a lot on this channel about personal finance, about investing. If you're interested in that type of thing, please subscribe because I think you'll enjoy the channel. Other than that, thanks for watching. Financial success.